Section 7.2, Integration by Parts. Okay, before we get started with Section 7.2, uh, let's just do a quick preview of Chapter 7 and a look back to what we know so far about integration. So, of course, as I think back to Calc 1, we did lots of integration in that uh, Chapter 4. And of course, what did we really learn? Well, through all those problems and with all the integrations we did, if you really boil it all down, we realized that there were really only two, I'm sorry, three integration formulas that we actually learned in Calc 1. Um, of course, the big one was the power rule. And then we also learned how to integrate sine and cosine. Now, yes, we did, by the way, or along the way, have some other integration formulas that we learned uh, that came as a consequence of knowing the derivatives of the other four trig functions. So for example, we knew that the integration of secant squared was tangent and so on. But in terms of basic fundamental formulas, these are the three that everything else keyed off of. And then of course, what did we do with these three? We built combinations of functions so composition, products, quotients, and so forth. And no matter how complicated those got, they always came back to one of those three. So for example, when we said, what's the integral of sine x cosine x, which is just a product of these two, well, that really became a problem number one. Because if we did u was equal to sine x, we saw that du was cosine x which means really this problem is really just a u du, which is a power rule problem. Okay, meaning, again, no matter how complicated the integrations were, they were always just one of these three in hiding. Okay, when we started Calc 2, what did we add? Well, we added the ability to integrate exponentials, general exponentials, 1 over u, and with those forms, we could find, handle more combinations. Uh, along the way, we also figured out what antiderivatives or what forms led to antiderivatives that were inverse trig functions. So for example, the dx over 1 plus x squared and the dx over the square root of 1 minus x squared and so on. Okay, now with all of that, it seems like we've really learned a lot of different integrations, integration techniques. And we have, but we're still fairly limited. What happens, for example, if I start trying to combine functions that don't seem to go together? For example, a polynomial and a logarithm. I know how to integrate x. I know how to integrate, well, we don't know how to integrate ln of x yet. But let's say we did. The question would be, how would I integrate the product of these two? And no matter how I try, it doesn't really work out to be a product. And it doesn't seem like it's going to work out to be any of these other forms that we've talked about in the first part of Calc 2, last chapter. So that's really what this chapter is about, is some more sophisticated techniques for combining functions that we know polynomials, trig, exponentials, logarithmic functions, radical functions, and so on. When we combine those into new combinations that we haven't been able to handle before, we're going to learn techniques in this chapter that help us attack some of those anti-differentiation problems. Uh, the first method is integration by parts. And integration by parts starts out from something very simple that we know. It's the old product rule for derivatives. Which we know says derivative of f times g is f prime g plus f g prime. Or to put that another way, um, f g prime minus f prime g equals f g prime. That's just isolating that term on the right side. Notice what would happen if I integrated both sides of this equation with respect to x. I'd have the integral or antiderivative 
of fg prime minus the integral of f prime g equals the integral of fg prime. Okay, what's this one right here? Well, when I take the antiderivative of the derivative of something, I just get the something. I get fg. So this says fg minus the integral of f prime g equals the integral of fg prime. Or just to turn that equation around, it's saying I can find the antiderivative of fg prime by calculating fg minus the antiderivative of f prime g, where notice I am switching which function has the derivative on it. Here I started out with f and g prime. Here I have g and f prime. Okay, now why is that important? Well, to calculate this integral directly, that is to find the antiderivative of fg prime, could be difficult, could be something I don't know how to do at all. But what this formula says is, if I can figure out what g is, which is the antiderivative of g prime. So that is, if I can figure out what that g is. Let me change that to another color. If I could determine what that g is, then it says I can evaluate the integral of fg prime by taking f times g minus the integral of f prime g. So notice this entire formula hinges on being able to figure out what the antiderivative of g prime is. Okay, now the question will be, is this integral easier to do or perhaps doable when this one is very difficult or perhaps not doable? If so, then that means I can actually manage to integrate fg prime by switching it out for the integral of f prime g, which is what this formula is really doing. It's tricking our solution or tricking us into a solution by switching out the derivative, derivative of fg prime or antiderivative of fg prime for the antiderivative of f prime g, which might be an easier one to do. Now, what happens if I choose an f and a g prime and then I run this formula, which, by the way, I'm going to call this the integration by parts formula. What happens if I run this formula and this integral is not easier to do? Well, it just means this method isn't going to be successful. Maybe I chose my f and g prime incorrectly, or maybe this method just doesn't apply to this particular integral. All right, before we start looking at examples, um, let's write this formula in a little different way, and then we can start talking about how to choose the f and the g prime and how to look at these problems. All right, before we do that, <clears throat> let's let u equal f and let v equal g. And I'm doing this to be consistent with your book and almost every other calculus book, which this is the custom for how to write this. If I make those substitutions, notice that du would be f prime of x dx and dv would be g prime of x dx. So let's look at our formula again, which says the integral of fg prime dx equals fg minus the integral of, and I'm going to write this one as g times f prime x dx. Okay, notice in this first integral we have fg prime of, of x dx. And notice that f is u, and g prime of x dx is dv, which means this first integral becomes u dv equals fg, which is simply uv, minus the integral of g, which is v, f prime of x dx. Well, f prime of x dx is du. 
Okay, this is the differential version of the integration by parts formula. It's certainly more compact looking. If you were memorizing this formula, this might be easier to memorize. This is the version that most people prefer to use. Uh, but notice again, what it really is saying is that we're taking the integral of u times v prime and that that should be equal to u v minus the integral of v times u prime. So we're just trading out u for f and v for g. Okay, so let's write our formula here at the top of the page and I'll write it in that differential form. So u dv equals uv minus the integral of v du. And just remember again what that's really saying is u v prime integrated should get me uv minus the integral of v times u prime. And let's look at our first example to start getting a flavor of this. So if I take the integral of x times ln of x, which is obviously a product, and I think about what the integration by parts formula says, well, it definitely does look like I'm always taking the integral of a product. And so if I look at it very simplistically, it looks like I should be viewing perhaps this integrand as a product where one of the factors would be the u and the other factor would be the dv. The question is which one is which? Which one do I pick? Well, we're not left with much choice in this example and you'll see why. Um, if I let, let's say, u equal x and v prime equal ln of x. So again, I have to call one of these things a u and one of these things a v prime. Okay, what would be wrong with making this choice? Well, no problem with the u. If u is x, u prime is 1. But if v prime is ln of x, then what I need to know is v, which is the antiderivative of ln of x, and I don't know that one yet. So again, two things to think about. Number one, v prime must be chosen as a function we can integrate. It's got to actually be a function that we know how to find the antiderivative on. Number two, u, u itself should be chosen so that, let's say, hopefully, v times u prime is, let's say, easier or possible to integrate versus u v prime, which is the one we started with. So again, remember, this formula is trading out the integral of u v prime for the integral v u prime. I want to pick the v prime so that I can actually integrate it and find a v. And I want to pick the u so that when I take its derivative, this combination v u prime hopefully is something that's easier to integrate or let's say possible if this original one was not possible. Now, in this case, again, we don't have much choice because I don't know how to integrate ln of x. Therefore, I'm not going to pick v prime to be the ln of x. I'm going to pick that to be the u, which means the v prime is going to be the other part in the product, which is the x. Okay, notice that u prime is equal to 1 over x. That does seem like a good thing because if I can do that, this part of the formula will no longer have a natural log in it at all. Okay, if v prime is x, what's v? It's x squared over 2. Now, anytime you're doing one of these problems and you've picked the u and the v prime, probably the next thing you should do is write down what's u prime and what's v. 
Okay, once you have those, now it's time to write out what the formula says. And we'll do more examples here in a bit to uh, start to get an increasing better sense of how to pick these two. Let's see, in this one, the formula says what? That if I want to integrate uv prime, it should be equal to uv. Well, what's uv? It's one half x squared ln x minus v du. Okay, what would that be? So it'd be minus v, which we said was one half x squared, u prime, which is one over x. Okay, so what's that? One half x squared ln x minus, uh, looks like I'm gonna end up with one half integral of just x. Okay, so now we see the power of this method this first example. What did this oops what did this v u prime become? Well it became one half x squared times one over x, which just became one half x. So essentially what we've done is traded out the integral x ln of x for the integral one half x with this u v term thrown in. And so now you see the power of this method. This is a considerably simpler integral than the integral that we started with, x ln x. And in this case, we're going to end up with an answer of 1 half x squared ln x minus x squared over 4. Uh, let's check that. If that's correct, then when I take the derivative of this function, 1 half x squared ln x, minus x squared over 4. I should get x ln x if this really is an antiderivative. So of course what's the derivative? Uh, if this is a product, the derivative of 1 half x squared should be x times ln x plus 1 half x squared times the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x, minus the derivative of x squared over 4, which is x over 2. Um, notice that this part is precisely x over 2, which means our derivative ends up being x ln x. All right, so definitely worked for us. And again, this first example should be illustrating for you the power of this method, which is that we are trading out the integral of a complicated product in this case x ln x, for the integral of hopefully a simpler product, in this case 1 half x. Now let's look at another example where it might at first be a little harder to decide which one to pick as the u and which one to pick as the v prime. Now I'll just say as a disclaimer, even with experience and even if you know what you're doing, Sometimes it's simply not clear which is which, and so you try something. Uh, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, then you back off and you try a different pattern of substitution. So for example, with this one, uh, once we learn some of these common forms uh, from experience, you'll know what to choose when you're using integration by parts. Uh, but let's take this as an example of even someone with experience perhaps not knowing what they're looking at. And so they're trying to figure out, let's say, what to pick for the u and what to pick for the v prime. Uh, let's say they just went ahead and said that u was the exponential part and the v prime was the polynomial part. Now, why would someone do that? And this would be a reasonable choice if they didn't know otherwise. Well, they would think to themselves, I don't know how to integrate e to the x squared, but I definitely know how to integrate x cubed. 
Now, the problem with this is what? Well, what's u prime? It's 2x e to the x squared. So already I see a problem. When I calculated u prime, I actually got something more complicated than what I started with. Now, when I say more complicated, that's because it's got that extra factor of x in it. It does depend on what happens when I figure out the v and put it with u prime. Maybe they go together in such a way that the overall product becomes simpler. But in this case, what happens if v prime is x cubed? Then v is the antiderivative of x cubed which is x to the fourth over four. That means in that second part of the integration by parts formula, where you do u v minus the integral of v u prime, what are you going to get for this integral? You're going to have the integral of x to the four over four times u prime, which is two x e to the x squared, which means actually I'm going to have one half x to the fifth e to the x squared. Okay, you can see in this example, with the way I've chosen these, this integral is actually worse than what I started with. Worse in the sense that that's an x to the fifth power instead of an x to the third. So this shows you how mischoosing the u and the v prime could actually lead you to something that's, let's say, even further away from the solution than you were when you started. All right, so... What could I do from there? Well, picking the u to be the exponential and picking the v prime to be the polynomial was no good. Okay, so somebody might say, let's switch that around. Well, so what are you going to do? Let v prime equal the exponential and let u equal the polynomial? Now, does that make sense? Well, for the u it makes sense because the derivative of x cubed will be an x squared function, which is a lower power. That seems good. Uh, v prime, though, we just said a minute ago, we don't know how to integrate e to the x squared. Uh, but we do know how to integrate x e to the x squared. Because if I did w equals x squared, dw would be 2x dx, which means... If I had a 2 there and a 1 half outside, that would be 1 half integral e to the w dw, which would be 1 half e to the w. So I don't know how to integrate e to the x squared, but I do know how to integrate x e to the x squared. Well, I do have three x's, so what if I just used one of those three to make this v prime, well, that would leave two left over. All right, so now I have built a combination of a u and a v prime where the u is x squared and the v prime is x e to the x squared. Okay, what's u prime? It's 2x. And what's v? we said it was 1 half e to the x squared. Okay, let's run our formula. So we're saying x cubed e to the x squared dx, which I'm viewing as x squared times x e to the x squared. So again, I'm calling this the u, and I'm calling this the v prime. And when I do that, what do I get? I get uv, so uv, which is 1 half x squared e to the x squared, minus the integral of v, which is 1 half e to the x squared, du, or in other words, u prime, which is 2x. Okay, what does that give me? 1 half x squared e to the x squared uh, looks like minus x e to the x squared. Okay, now, what do I have here with this integral? Is that one that we can do? Well, the answer is yes. It's the one we just did a few minutes ago. 
when we said v prime was x e to the x squared, that's exactly what we have now. And we said the antiderivative of that was 1 half e to the x squared. Okay, now this is a good example for you to look at to see how that the choice of the u and the v prime is essential. If I make the wrong choice, uh, it could simply lead to something that I can't do or gets further away from the answer. Okay, if that happens, which it's bound to, it just means you back off and switch your choices. Something else this example shows you is I don't have to look at these two purely as the u and the v prime. If there's a power of x there, maybe I could take some of the x's to put with the other factor to make something that I can find an antiderivative for. And if I see an e to the x squared, I know that if I had an x with it, I can actually integrate that. Okay, let's try this one. And this is a pretty standard form that you're going to see in the homework. So I'm going to put a polynomial against a trig function. And if you think about it, what we just did in the last example was put a polynomial against an exponential function. And what we did in the first example was put a polynomial against a log function. So again, what's, what's the basic pattern here? We are forming products of different types of functions that we couldn't really put together before and find antiderivatives. All right, so now we're looking at a polynomial and a trig function. Okay, now, do I know how to take derivatives and antiderivatives for x? Yes. Do I know how to take derivatives and antiderivatives for cosine? Yes. So unless I know something in advance or I have experience with this kind of form, it's a toss-up. Um, I'll just try something. I'll try u equals the cosine part, and I'll try v prime equals the polynomial part. Then, of course, I should just write down what I've got. Well, if u is cosine, that means u prime would be negative 2 sine 2x. If v prime is x, that means v is x squared over 2. Now I just put this together using my formula. uv prime is uv minus integral of v u prime, which means in this case x cosine 2x is uv, so uv, which is going to be x squared over 2 times cosine 2x minus the integral of v, which is x squared over 2, u prime, which is that minus 2 sine 2x. Okay, so what does that give me? It gives me x squared over 2 cosine 2x. Uh, looks like these two minuses will give me a plus. And I will say, uh, just for you know, a little disclaimer here, one of the things, one of the technicalities that students get in trouble with sometimes, and even I do sometimes, is when you start getting these more complicated integration by parts formulas, uh, you can lose track of these sign combinations. And you'll see more of that in the next few examples. So just be careful of that. In this case, a plus, and it looks like the twos are going to go. So it looks like what I'm left with is the integral of x squared sine of 2x. Okay, uh, is this going to get me anywhere? Well, I've traded out the cosine for a sine. That might not be the end of things. But the thing that does not look good to me at all is I've traded out x for an x squared. And if I couldn't handle this combination, I don't think I'm going to be able to handle that combination. Now, as you'll see shortly, another tack that we can take is if you've integrated by parts once, 
sometimes you may be able to, may be able to iteratively integrate by parts again. And I'll show you that here in example. But you notice with this one that if integrating by parts once turned that x into an x squared, sorry, then doing integration by parts on this again is probably going to make that x squared an even larger power, which is no good. All right, what that means is this choice is not the right choice. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay, that's fine. We just tried something, so now we try the other. Uh, we could let u equal the x. We could let v prime equal the cosine function. Okay, let's try that on the next page. So again, we were doing integral x cosine 2x. And now we're going to try u equals x and v prime equals the cosine part of that product. Okay, write down what we've got. Well, I like the looks of this a lot. If u is equal to x, then I know u prime is just equal to 1. If v prime is equal to cosine 2x, then I know v is 1 half sine 2x. All right, so again, writing the formula, u v prime integral should go back to u v minus the integral v u prime, which in this case, uh, again, the x is being played by the u, and the v prime is being played by the cosine 2x, or vice versa. And then our formula says it should be uv, so uv, this was v right here. Sorry, getting carried away with my equal signs. Okay, so uv, which would be what, 1 half x sine 2x? Minus integral v which is 1 half sine 2x u prime, which is 1. Okay, and again, similar to the last example, I recognize that that's just a basic integral at this point. My answer should be 1 half x sine 2x minus 1 half the integral of sine 2x, which would be minus one-half times minus one-half cosine 2x, which of course gives me one-half x sine 2x plus one-quarter cosine 2x. Okay, so this example uh, definitely shows you, at least for the combination of a polynomial and a basic sine or cosine, which pattern not to use and why it goes wrong and then the pattern that you do want to use. Now I will say as, as a general rule of thumb, if one of my two factors is polynomial, most of the time that's probably the one I want to pick for the u. I already know that if u is a polynomial, u prime is a polynomial of lower degree, which so far in the two examples where we've done that it has led to something very nice. So as a rule, if I were trying some new form I hadn't seen before and one of the two factors was a polynomial, that's probably the one that I would pick for the U. Okay, let's try another combination. So since we're building all of these combinations of common functions, uh, here's another real basic combination I would expect. That is to put a polynomial against an exponential function. Okay, again, it's, it's not completely random how I choose these. And the more I practice, the more experience I have, I can look at this and eliminate certain choices that I probably wouldn't want to make. So for example, if I let u equal the exponential part and v prime 
equal the polynomial part. We've already seen this sort of thing from the first two examples. When I let my v prime be a polynomial, the v is going to be a polynomial of higher power. And if I choose my u to be an exponential, then u prime in this case is actually going to be that same exponential back again, except with a 3 in front of it. Okay, that means when I get to the part of the integration by parts formula that has the the v u prime, that's going to be 3x cubed over 3 e to the 3x, which would be an x cubed e to the 3x, which again is worse than where I started. The power on the x is one larger. Okay, so from experience, after a while, I'm going to figure out that for most of these combinations, I probably don't want to let u be the exponential, and I probably don't want to let v prime be the polynomial. So let's get rid of that, and let's go with the choice that seems more obvious, which is to let u equal the polynomial, and let v prime equal the exponential. Okay, if I do that, what's u prime? Of course, it's a smaller power of x, which is good. What's v? Well, it's the antiderivative of e to the 3x, which is 1 third e to the 3x. So again, just to keep repeating our formula, and we'll write it here at the top, integral of u v prime equals u v minus the integral of v u prime. So in this case, x squared e to the 3x is going to be equal to u v, so u v, one third x squared e to the 3x minus the integral of v, which is one third e to the 3x times u prime, which is 2x. Okay, which gives me one third x squared e to the three x looks like minus two thirds um, x e to the three x integral x e to the three x. All right, so what sort of integral are we left with here? Well, it's an integral of x e to the three x with respect to x. Okay, what do I do with that? Well. The thing I should notice is that when I started out with this integral of x squared e to the 3x, I've traded that off for an integral that involves x e to the 3x. In other words, I managed to reduce this power from 2 to 1. And so the enterprising person might think, if doing this integration by parts reduced that power, could I do integration by parts again on this integral to reduce that power of x to nothing. So this is our first example of doing iterative integration by parts, that is applying integration by parts again. Think about what we did with L'Hopital's rule where we kept applying it over and over again. Uh, we can do that sort of thing with integration by parts. So what I'm going to do is write the integral of x squared e to the 3x dx is equal to one third x squared e to the three x minus two thirds times and now I'm going to do a little mini integration by parts problem to handle that integral x e to the three x. Okay, a big note here, so important. Um, whatever pattern you chose for u and v prime in the, let's say, first iteration of the integration by parts, let's call it, stick with that pattern.
that is don't switch the pattern and what I mean by that is up here what did you pick for the u you picked u to be the polynomial part and you picked v prime to be the exponential part when you're doing this second application of integration by parts don't switch these around and go back to u is the exponential and v prime is the poly now in this one you wouldn't think to do that because we showed before why that doesn't make sense but in some more complicated problems uh, when you get in the middle of the problem it would be easy possibly to forget what you were doing and maybe switch these two if you do normally what happens is you sort of go backwards or you undo what you had just gained by doing the first integration by parts so make sure that once you pick a pattern which is what we did up here stick with that pattern if you have to do repeated integration by parts meaning I want to stick with u equals the polynomial part and v prime is the other part the exponential of course here what's u prime it's 1 that looks great v prime is that 1 third e to the 3x again so what is the integral x e to the 3x it's uv which would be 1 third x e to the 3x minus the integral of v which is 1 third e to the 3x times u prime which was 1 which means now this integral just becomes minus integral 1 third e to the 3x that's 1 third x e to the 3x minus 1 ninth e to the 3x okay now what is this answer that we just found it's the antiderivative of x e to the 3x which was this integral right here so it was minus 2 thirds integral x e to the 3x which we have determined is 1 third x e to the 3x minus 1 ninth e to the 3x okay let me erase this so what do we have for an answer now our original integral x squared e to the 3x is 1 third x squared e to the 3x that's coming from right here minus two-thirds times one-third x e to the 3x which would be minus two-ninths x e to the 3x and then be careful with your signs here it's minus two-thirds times minus one-ninth e to the 3x which is going to be plus two-twenty-sevenths e to the 3x and there's my antiderivative and this would be a good typical example to show you when I would want to do a repeated integration by parts and the main thing I want to stress again is don't change the pattern when you do that second integration by parts stick with the substitution pattern you chose up here for your u and your v prime okay a few more examples I want to look at uh, three three examples especially to show you some of the the other common things so for our next example let's look at this one well here's another combination we haven't done before an exponential against a basic trig function a sine function okay this is always a fun one uh, I'm going to let u equal e to the x. I'm going to let v prime equal sine x. Now, if I do that, what's u prime? It's e to the x. What's v? It's the antiderivative of sine, which is minus cosine. So let's run the formula. And again, just for reference, we're saying that this is the u 
and we're saying that this is the V prime. So I won't recopy the formula this time. I'll just say e to the x sine x is equal to uv, so uv, which would be e to the x times minus cosine x. So let's just put the minus out in front. So minus e to the x cosine x minus the integral of v. Well, if v is a minus cosine x, I know that's going to make a plus cosine x when I put it with the negative that was there from the integration by parts formula, times u prime, which is e to the x. Okay, now, have we gained anything? The answer is, well, it doesn't appear so. I've traded out the integral of e to the x sine x for the integral e to the x cosine x. In other words, this integration by process, integration by parts process, changed this integral into an expression that involves this integral. And I don't seem to have gotten anywhere. All right, when that happens, here's something you can try, and this will often work. What happens if I try integration by parts again? Well, if you're guessing, your guess would probably be that it would convert this integral back into this form again. And at first, that might lead you to think, uh, why would I do that? Where would, what would that get me? Well, let's do it, and you'll see. So I'm going to work on the integral of e to the x cosine x, and I'm going to do integration by parts on this one. Just remember what we said before. If in your first integration by parts, your substitution pattern was to let the exponential be the u and to let the v prime be the trig function, then stick with that. Which means here I should let u equal e to the x again, and I should let v prime equal the cosine function. Of course, that means u prime is again e to the x, and it means v is sine x. So what's this equal to? Well, it should be uv, which would be e to the x sine x minus the integral of v times u prime. Well, v times u prime would be e to the x sine x. So indeed, we've ended up with the same form that we started out with at the beginning. But notice something really pretty remarkable happens here. So let's go back to our original problem. Let's write the whole thing out so you can see it. e to the x sine x dx, we said, was equal to minus e to the x cosine x plus the integral of e to the x cosine x, which we have figured out is this right here. All right, now notice this guy, of course, as we said, is the same as this guy, but they're not the same. The one on the left has a positive in front of it. The one over here on the far right has a negative in front of it. If I put these two together on the left side of the equation, that is, I add the integral e to the x sine x, then you do notice that I'm going to have two of them on the left. And then on the right, I'm going to have these two terms. Let's call that e to the x sine x minus e to the x cosine x. What happens if I divide both sides by 2? Then, of course, on the left side, I get integral e to the x sine x dx, which is the integral I'm trying to figure out, equals e to the x sine x minus e to the x cosine x over 2. And that is my answer. Now, this is very typical of an exponential versus a sine or cosine function. If you do the integration by parts a second time, you will get another one of those integrals that you started out with, 
but the difference is there will be some other coefficient in front of that integral except rather than a 1. In this case it was a minus 1. Now what number appears there depends on what other numbers are in the function and by that I mean this x could be an ax, this x could be a bx. In other words we're talking about the general form e to the ax let's say cosine bx. When the a and the b are not 1's this minus 1 will be something else. Uh, let's, let's do another one real quickly just to track it and see how that would work. So let's make up something like integral of e, let's say, to the 2x times, let's say, cosine. Let's make it sine this time. Wait a minute, what did we do last time? We did sine, so we'll do cosine. Let's say cosine of 5x. Now, what were our substitutions we did in the last problem? Let's go back and look. Up here at the top, we let u equal the exponential, and we let v prime be the trig function. What would have happened if we tried the other pattern of substitution? What if we had let u equal the trig function? and we let v prime equal the exponential function. Uh, would this process have worked if we'd done it that way? Well, let's see, u prime would be 5 sine 5x, and v would be the antiderivative of e to the 2x, which would be 1 half e to the 2x. All right, so let's write this out. We would have e to the 2x cosine 5x, and now just to be clear, we are saying this is the u, and we're saying this is the v prime. And now that should be uv, so uv, which is 1 half e to the 2x cosine 5x, minus integral v, which of course is 1 half e to the 2x, times u prime, which is 5 sine 5x. So we have 1 half e to the 2x cosine 5x uh, looks like minus 5 halves integral e to the 2x sine 5x. Okay, now if you're looking at this and comparing to what we did in the last problem, um, it does look like this integral has been switched out for the same one, but with the cosine switched to the sine, which is the same thing that happened back here when we did this substitution pattern. So the, I'm thinking perhaps that switching the u and the v prime pattern may actually work here. And that is another point of this example is that sometimes switching and making the other choice will still work and it will work for this problem. Okay, so we know what's going to happen. We're going to have to try and do integration by parts again to get that guy turned back into an integral that has cosine in it. Well again, make sure you stick with the pattern of substitution you picked. This time you went with this pattern, so you have to stick with that pattern. Okay, so that means I should be letting u equal sine 5x. I should let v prime equal e to the 2x again. And of course that means u prime should equal 5 cosine 5x. Okay, I could edit this, but I'm just going to run with it. I realize I just made a mistake, and you've probably already caught me. But when we said u is equal to cosine of 5x up here, this u prime should have a negative in front of it, shouldn't it? Rather than edit this, let's, uh, let's pretend I'm a student here and I've made a mistake, and this wasn't not intentional. 
would it be easy enough to adjust my work now without erasing everything? Well, let's see. When I come back here and I go to look at the other side, this was the UV. Okay, notice the UV will be the same. It's the VU prime that's different. The VU prime, which is that combination, now has this negative in it. Okay, if that negative is there, it would be right there. What happens when I put those two negatives together? This becomes a plus. Okay, so that's the change from my error. So, w would I have caught this later on? Yes. The problem's not going to work out uh, if the sign was left as in mistaken form. So I've caught it now. Um, if you catch it later, uh, you'll, you'll see what goes wrong if that sign's not correct. You'll see here in a second. All right, so let's go back to our integration down here. We said u is sine 5x, so u prime should be 5 cosine 5x. What's v? It should be 1 half e to the 2x. So now what's the integral of e to the 2x sine 5x? It should be uv, which would be 1 half e to the 2x sine 5x minus the integral of v du. In other words, it's 1 half e to the 2x sine 5x minus 5 integral e to the 2x cosine 5x. Okay, now, what were we trying to do down here in red? We were trying to get a handle on what the integral of e to the 2x sine 5x is by doing integration by parts again. And when we did, what we got for an answer was this. So if I go back to this line, putting everything together, I've got the integral of e to the 2x cosine 5x is equal to 1 half e to the 2x cosine 5x plus 5 halves times the integral of e to the 2x sine 5x, which is this guy right here. So that would be 1 half e to the 2x sine 5x minus 5 integral e to the 2x cosine 5x. Okay, put that all together, and what do I have? Integral e to the 2x cosine 5x is 1 half e to the 2x cosine 5x plus, looks like 5 fourths e to the 2x sine 5x minus 25 halves integral e to the 2x cosine 5x. All right, now think about what happened in our previous example. We got our original problem to be expressed in terms of itself, but there is this weird coefficient or other coefficient in front of that integral. If I add that to the other side, which is adding 25 halves times that integral, well, if I think of this guy over here as being 2 halves, when I add these two together, I'll get 27 halves integral e to the 2x cosine 5x equals 1 half e to the 2x cosine 5x plus 5 fourths e to the 2x sine 2x. Okay, I'm trying to solve for this integral. That means to do that, I need to divide by that number. Okay, notice that that would just be the same as multiplying both sides of that equation. Oops. 
multiplying both sides of that equation by 2 over 27. And there's my answer. Okay, so a slightly more long-winded example similar to the last one. It's just that I've done a generic e to the ax cosine bx problem here for you, where a is 2 and b is 5. And obviously it led to this strange 2 27ths along with the 5 fourths in here as well. So ultimately, what would you get if you expanded this or distributed uh, from the first part here? Oops. From the first part here, there would be a 2 over 54. And then when you do these two parts, there'd be a 10 over, what, 108 are the coefficients you would get in those terms. Okay, two more examples I want to look at. And these last two, we'll put those under the same heading. Um, so let's start with a very traditional integral that you're going to learn right now, and you're going to see problems like this. So we're going to integrate tan inverse of x. And you notice when you look back at your inverse trig functions, we had integrals of various forms that led to inverse trig functions. In particular, we know that the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is tan inverse. But we never determined what the antiderivative of tan inverse is. All right, now, does this really fit, or does it seem like integration by parts would apply? And this is where we sort of explode the idea that the integrand has to look like a product because I really only see one function there. And so you can actually apply <coughs> excuse me, integration by parts to something that doesn't look like a product, and there are two tricks for doing that, and that's what I'm going to show you in these two examples. And the first one is really simple, and it's just a trick that you add to the bag of tricks. And it is, let's insert a 1. And if I do that, I can definitely call one of these two things the u and one of them the v prime. Now, I certainly don't want to let that one be the u because then u prime would be 0. And that means my final integral in the formula would be 0. That's not going to help. Okay, that means I'm going to let u be the original function that I was integrating, which was the tan inverse. And more to the point, it means that v prime is going to be the 1. So what we're saying here, if you just want to sort of think generically about the trick I'm describing here, if I have the integral of a function, and it doesn't look like there's two functions there, it looks like there's just one function there, I'm going to insert a 1 and I'm going to call that the v prime. And then the function I was trying to integrate, I'm just going to call that u. Okay, if I do that, uh, what happens with this function? Well, if u is tan inverse and v prime is 1, well, of course, that v prime is always going to turn into v equals x. Now, what about the u? Well, we're not asking for the antiderivative. We're asking for the derivative. And we do know what the derivative of tangent is. It's 1 over 1 plus x squared. All right, so what's the integration by parts formula say? It says antiderivative of uv prime is uv. So uv, which would be x times tan inverse x, minus the integral of v times u prime. And this was u prime. Well, if I take this v times this u prime, I get x times 1 over 1 plus x squared. Or in other words, x over 1 plus x squared. OK, you should recognize in that integral that if I let u equal 1 plus x squared, then du equals 2x dx. 
meaning if I had a 2 there and a 1 half out here, this would actually be a log integral. That is, it would be 1 half times the integral of, let's call it dw over w, which is 1 half times the natural log of w. So in this case, the integral of tan inverse is x tan inverse x minus 1 half times the natural log of 1 plus x squared. And I'll just leave the absolute value off the 1 plus x squared because 1 plus x squared is always positive. Okay, there is my antiderivative. And it seems almost like I got something from nothing. I just introduced a factor of 1, which is already there invisibly, called that v prime, created an integration by parts problem. And when I did, notice what happened. The u prime made the tan inverse function disappear. It became this 1 over 1 plus x squared. The combination of that 1 over 1 plus x squared with the x gave me something that I could integrate. Actually, it ended up being a 1 over w form. Okay, in your homework, you'll be asked to in a similar way, find the antiderivative of sine inverse, cosine inverse, cotan inverse. This same method could be applied to all those problems to come up with the standard antiderivative formulas for those inverse trig functions as well. So this trick of inserting a 1 is a, is a pretty important trick. So let's look at one last example. So the problem I want to look at is e raised to the square root of x integrated with respect to x. Okay, so again, uh, reaching into the bag of tools, this looks like a single function, not a product. So the thing I might think to do is write this as the integral of 1 times e to the square root of x. So it's that thing we just did in the last example. I insert the 1, and we call that v prime, which means we're letting u equal e to the square root of x. So let's see, what does that give us? If we let u equal e to the square root of x, and we let v prime equal 1, then of course v is going to be x, just as before u prime is going to be the derivative of e to the square root of x, which would be e to the square root of x times the derivative of square root of x, which is 1 over 2 square root of x. Applying my integration by parts formula, I would get that e to the square root of x is equal to uv, which would be x e to the square root of x, minus the integral of v times u prime. Okay, what's that turn out to? x e to the square root of x uh, looks like minus, I'll pull the 1 half out, and then what I have here is an x over square root of x, which is actually just square root of x times e to the square root of x. Okay, so the question is, is this integral right here one that I can do? That is, question mark, can I handle the integral square root of x e to the square root of x? And so two questions. Number one, can I handle that with some method we already have learned before Chapter 7? Or might I have to apply integration by parts again? Well, if I was trying to apply methods that we have learned or have known before this chapter, um, I would probably immediately look at that exponent, since I see an exponential there, and I would probably think to make the substitution u equals the square root of x, which means du equals 1 over 2 square root of x dx. Or to put it another way, dx equals 2 times the square root of x du, 
but notice since square root of x is just u, that means dx is just 2u du. Okay, putting that all together, what do we have? We have integral of square root of x, which we've called u. We have e to the square root of x, which is e to the u. We have dx, which is 2u to the du. That means we have 2 integral u squared e to the u. Okay, is this a problem that I know how to handle that general form? I'm not going to do it here, but you should definitely be nodding your head yes. Integration by parts will handle this form. We did an example like this earlier with a polynomial matched against an exponential. And for that, if I let the u be the polynomial part and I let v prime be the exponential, then every time I apply integration by parts, I repeatedly get a smaller degree polynomial times that same exponential until eventually I can eliminate the polynomial altogether. So I will say that by doing this basic trick, it does lead us to an auxiliary problem, which is another integration by parts. Now that would work, and if you attack the problem this way, that you're doing very well, and we'll get to the correct answer. I want to show you a slightly different way of looking at this, though. So give me a second while I erase all this. Okay, all cleaned up. So there is another trick that's sort of a play on the inserting one trick. What's the problem right now? Basically, I don't know how to find the antiderivative e to the square root of x. Okay, what's missing there? Well, again, if I was viewing this as an e to the u, where you're saying u is the square root of x, then of course what's missing is 1 over 2 times the square root of x. In other words, if I had e to the square root of x over 2 square root of x, I could integrate this. The answer would be e to the square root of x. The problem is I don't have this thing that I need to make an appropriate du for u equals that square root of x. All right, so this is a variation on the trick of inserting the 1. Instead of inserting a 1, let's insert the thing, and let me actually do this in a different color. Sorry, I can't choose my colors. Let's insert the thing that we would need to make this something we could actually integrate. So if you see what I mean there, I'm saying let's add in or divide by the 2 square root of x so that I actually get something that I can integrate. Now, of course, the thing is, if you had divided by 2 square root of x, you have to do the same thing out here except multiply. What you're really doing there, of course, is multiplying by 2 square root of x over 2 square root of x so that you're not really changing the integrand. So if you see, what I am really doing is taking e square root of x and inserting a 1, but I'm doing it in a very special way. I'm figuring out what I need to, let's say, append to that e square root of x to make something that I can integrate. And if I had to divide by something, then I'm going to have to multiply by that same thing. Similarly, if I had had to divide or multiply by that, I would have had to divide to balance things out. All right, now, let's say I've done that. It should be real clear at this point that this is the guy I want to be the V prime because I've just manufactured something that has an antiderivative. That means this guy is going to be the u. All right. If u is equal to 2 square root of x and v prime is equal to e to the square root of x over 2 square root of x, well, first question is, what's v? And that's easy. We made this thing up so that the antiderivative was exactly what we know it should be. Okay, what's the other thing I have to look at? u prime. Well, let's u prime if u is 2 square root of x. It's actually 
1 over the square root of x. So let's put this all together. Integral of e squared of x with respect to x is uv, which is what? 2 square root of x e to the square root of x minus the integral v, which is e square root of x, times u prime, which is 1 over square root of x. So that's 2 square root of x e to the square root of x minus the integral e to the square root of x over square root of x. All right, we already talked about it up here. This integral would be great if it looked like e to the square root of x over 2 square root of x because that would be e to the u du. Well, that's easy. The only thing that's missing is a 2. And once I do that, what is the antiderivative of what is the antiderivative of e to the square root of x over 2 square root of x? It's e square root of x. So this should be 2 square root of x e to the square root of x minus 2 e to the square root of x. And there's my antiderivative. So hopefully this example shows you this more general form of the inserting 1 trick. I really am inserting 1, but I'm doing it in this very particular way. I'm taking the function that they give me, which in this case was the e to the square root of x function. I am joining something to it. In this case, that was the 2 square root of x. So that this whole thing becomes something I have an easy antiderivative for. Okay, but whatever you've put in there, in this case, it was that 2 square root of x. You're going to have to balance that out so that the thing you're really putting in there is just a 1. Okay, that other thing then is going to have to become your, sorry, that other thing is going to have to become your u. Then run through your integration by parts. And if this is a particular form to which this trick applies neatly, then this function you end up with, that is the v u prime, might just end up being something simple. And there are many, many function combinations that this trick works on pretty well. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Uh, let's stop there, and we'll see if you have questions next week.